So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to elaborate a little bit about how we do under sowing and different approaches to cover crop establishment in the in Danish cereal rotations. And um, the agenda for today, it's uh, mainly for you uh, later watching this uh, on the recording, but uh, I will quickly in do some personal introductions, who I am and then why we do cover cropping, and then we will get into under sowing at different technologies and et cetera. Um, first of all, I'm a <clears throat> agronomist, a farming system specialist at uh, this uh, Danish uh, advisory company called uh, Agrovi. And we recently got a, a, par uh, or a sister company for outside of Denmark consulting, which we call Agroganic. And I'm a member of the Danish uh, Nodal organization, FRDK, which is actually also having quite a lot of Norwegian and Swedish uh, members because so far there's not been a min and nodal organization in Norway and Sweden. I hold a master's degree in agricultural sciences from the University of Copenhagen, and I've both worked in New Zealand and studied in the US. And then together with my parents, I have a family farm in Denmark, roughly two hours west of Copenhagen, where we've been uh, non plowing since uh, non plowing for almost 25 years and uh, direct seeding conservation agriculture for 10 years. Quickly about Agrovi is a farmer owned uh, advisory company. We do everything farmers need, both from accounting and stuff, but I work in the department mainly for uh, agronomy. And then we do international consulting with a main emphasis on the Baltics in Lithuania and Latvia and uh, also some in Estonia. And then we have um, also some farms in Ukraine we help. And um, it's actually really nice to get a different perspective to farming than what I'm used to in uh, in Denmark. And I believe it's more similar the climate we are working with in uh, in especially in Estonia, but also in Latvia and Lithuania. It's probably more similar to your conditions with strong cold winters and a short transition from winter to intensive growth and summertime. And then we also have a little bit of um, consulting in Sweden, which is obviously Scania, which is closest to where I'm based. Um, just to put a perspective of why we do cover cropping, I, uh, I really like these rainfall simulators, which shows how different management approaches to farmland has an effect on erosion and the stability of our soil during winter. And there's two main drivers. There's the uh, natural structure of our soils, which we can promote by reducing the intensity of the tillage we do. And then there's the soil cover perspective, which we can do by retaining residues or growing perennial crops. And from the left, we see a full tillage, no residue cover. And we see there's a lot of water and it's brown water in the bucket. And as we approach less tillage and more soil cover, we get more water infiltration into the soil and we get less particles um, being flushed out of our soil. That's why you see there's less water and it's more clear water. And why this matters is that when we're not growing a crop in our field, we should try to have the soil covered by the residue, but we should also try to aim in getting some of these perennial crop effects. And our crops are for good purposes, not perennial, they are annual crops, so we can wet uh, integrated cover cropping, we can try to kind of mimic some of the agro ecosystem effects of perennial crops by introducing out of season cover cropping. This is just some very common pictures around the Danish landscape at this time of the year. It's a uh, bad uh, farm management, which is uh, has led to this erosion and it's it's not because it's been excessively red. It's not because it's been raining a lot or dry or windy. It's just 100% the fault of the farmers in this situation. I I, I know it, it sounds a little bit harsh. I'm a farmer myself, but it's 100% avoidable and it's our own fault. And it's just something we should really try and limit and eliminate as farmers that the soil is flushing away. Well, mainly we pay a lot of money for the soil and for the land, so there's no reason to let it being flushed away. And secondly, it's it's not a, not a good environmental story that we have. You can see the sand deposits here in front of the car. 
but that's only the most heavy stuff, the sand, all the clay and the uh, humus part of organic matter is flushed into the waterway in the back and onto clay and organic matter. That's where all our nutrients are locked away, but it's also where our pesticides are designed to stick together. So it's really double edged bad thing. All right, so um, it really gets us back to holding our soil in place with plant roots and we can see it here from a a grassy root from a tall fescue uh, to the left, which has a lot of gluing a potential to glue our soil together. And we can see it from a hep root of the lucerne to the right. And now we talked about cover cropping in an erosion perspective. And the last thing is also that cover crops helps us harvest more sunlight. I know the growing season is much shorter, but also more intensive in Finland. I would assume uh, you would have even longer uh, days of sun in the summer than we do here in Denmark. And just to put it into perspective, normally uh, most of our spring and winter crops we will harvest in the first week of August in Denmark, which means that most of our crops will start senior sensing and you know getting yellow from the middle of uh, July ish. So we really stop collecting sunlight in the early or mid July in Denmark, and then you can see all this plant available light or radiation is still available until we reach October. So if, if we can get a, a good cover crop growing right after our cereal harvest, we have a lot of light both in July and August to capture and make biomass before the winter starts in November. Yes, and um, we have done quite a lot of um, trials with cover cropping in Denmark for quite a lot of years. Um, just to put in the perspective, we have a lot of um, different cover cropping laws by the environmental agency in, uh, in Denmark, which kind of tells the farmers slash pays the farmers to grow cover crops. And it's depending on where around in Denmark and the waterways, it's specific to each waterway, but somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of the farmland has to be in cover cropping each year, which means that after or after winter cereals, before spring cereals, we will have to seed in a cover crop in no later than the 20th of August, and it has to be there all the autumn and the winter. Uh, this trial is uh, a few years old, but it, it shows quite a lot of interesting things. It's a fertilizer response trial based on different amounts of cover cropping. And I know it's uh, it's different, both yield potentials and also biomass potential in your cover crops between Denmark and Finland. But one of the things I find really interesting in this trial is that by growing a winter veg and oil seed, uh, oil radish uh, cover crop, it's the black one. We actually, in this trial, were able to grow a higher total yield, no matter the nitrogen, than a no fertilizer control plant. So there was both a fertilizer effect from cover cropping, which we could not recover, no matter the amount of nitrogen we applied to a non cover crop spring crop. So there's, besides from nitrogen application, indirectly from the cover crop, there's also a soil structure perspective of growing cover crops, which um, improves the farmability and the yield potential of our land if we do it right and we do it in the in the right perspective. And I find that quite interesting because normally both as agronomists and as farmers, we like to look at how much nitrogen can we grow in our cover crops and what how big a yield can we get from not applying too much nitrogen. But in this case, we actually got more than only nitrogen out of it. Yes. And then to the under sowing thing. The context in Denmark is that we grow a lot of grass seeds and forest seeds. I'm sure you uh, know that in Denmark you have this Danish farmer owned company called DLF Seeds, which grows a lot of forest plants all over the world. So we have a large production land of that roughly 100,000 hectares are forage seed production land. And then on top of that, we have a lot of 
grass clover mixture lays uh, for the cows also. So every year, the, a couple of hundred thousand hectares in Denmark will be seeded into new grassland. And the most common practice is to under sow this grass and clover uh, in between the rows of the spring barley, because then we 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 have a, a, a the we in order to get a good uh, grass uh, established, we need to put it in in the spring barley so we can get a lot of good growth before the winter in the autumn. So a lot of my pictures will be based around uh, grass, but the similar applies to some more relevant cover crop species, which I will get back to. And um, just to um, understand some a little bit of this wording, which can be a little bit confusing. Um, I already mentioned this with the DLF seeds. Um, the way I use the wording uh, is that under sowing um, is the technique that we will seed um, either together with the spring barley or a few days later, uh, we will seed uh, the cover crop into the spring barley. Overseeding is a kind of a in-between wording where we will spread or seed the cover crop somewhere between a few leaves of the barley or spring cereal until uh, almost right before harvest. And then interseeding is the is the it's another thing where we'll kind of relay seed. So we will kind of try four weeks before the harvest of the spring barley. We will try to get in and seed or spread some of the seeds of the cover crop seeds. So it's already kind of sucked in moisture and are ready to grow when we harvest. And I will try to get back to all three perspectives. So at this time of the year, when we go to the field and we need to seed spring barley, we have two main options in our under sowing. If we have a an advanced um, seed drill, we can do both the, uh, let's say the spring barley seed and the fertilizer and the uh, cover crop seeds, all three of them together in the in the seed row, and then do it on skipped rows. So every second row will be barley, and every second row will be cover crop seeds. That's how this picture is seeded. So it's the same seed drill which has seeded barley and fertilizer in the barley rows, and then there's been extra openers to only seed the grass in the middle. Um, there's pros and cons of that as uh, perspective, mainly that it you need a advanced seed drill with a lot of cultures and openers. So a second uh, and another perspective could be to use your your normal uh, spring barley seed drill and then just drill the field a second time, either a few days after you seeded your spring barley, or you can wait until the barley has between one and three leaves because then it's safe to drive in the field again. Um, if you're an organic farmer, you you can you look into using your your in between row hooing to you know you you row hoo uh, to take out the weeds between the rows of your cereal, and you can modify your your inter row hoo to also be able to seed. The benefit is that you get early establishment before dry um, dry uh, summer weather, and you also um, get most of it done in a time of the year where you are focused on seeding and you're not busy harvesting. It can look a little bit like this. So in the picture, it's a, a inter row who modified with some kind of seed culture just to put the seeds in the soil surface. So this one would be very common in our maize growing in Denmark because we also do cover crops in maize, but that's another story. But you could also modify this to grow, go in maybe one month after seeding your spring barley and then take out the weeds while putting in your cover crops. Um, the most important thing from under sowing this crop is that you need to seed your cover crop. Uh, we've done many trials and there's a big difference between spreading cover crop seeds onto the soil surface or putting this, um, the seeds some some kind of into the soil and pressing it afterwards. So one to two centimeters seeding depth works for most small cover crop seeds, but the most important is that you need to put them into separate rows. 
if you put um, we always have very variable and very bad results by doing the cover crop seeds in the same row as the cereal. So always try to get your your second part when you're whenever if you're drilling second time or you modify a drill, you need to have separate rows for the cereal and separate rows for the cover crop. And depending on uh, GPS guidance systems and stuff, you can sometimes drill second time in between the cereal rows, but other times it's more safe to go maybe 20 degrees to an angle when you seed the field the second time. The most important thing is that you do not seed your cover crop in the same row as your cereal. And then also uh, the quick note down here is that one thing is seeding depth and you can risk having too, too deep seeding of your small seeded cover crops, but it's always preferred to have the seeds a little bit into the soil with a little bit of soil on top and then rest accordingly than it is just to spread them on top. So if if you if the alternative is to spread the seeds on the soil surface, it's better to put them in as shallow as you can, but still with a seed drill where you have the option for having these uh, uh, roller tires to, to press it a little bit. And then some of the the uh, mainly basic normally recommendation we do for most of our grass seed farmers, but also applies for under sowing cover crops is that you, it all starts by selecting your, your, uh, your, your spring crop variety. I believe it's mainly um, maybe also spring wheat in your example, but uh, spring barley and spring oats, you really need to have a logging resisting spring cereal. You should not have it you can if the crop is you know tipping over and uh, doing lodging that is the biggest threat for under sown crops so you need to have a strong tall, strong standing cereal and you can maybe consider using growth regulator accordingly because you cannot allow your your crop to tip over and lodge also you can consider to increase the road distance if you have 25 centimeters of road distance instead of maybe 12 or 15, you will both have stronger stems in your cereal plant, but you will also have more light for your under sown crop. So it, it can still keep growing a little bit uh, before your, your cereal gets too big. It's important to let light down to your under sown crop. I'm aware that for your climate, it's probably um, a, a, a potential for a yield hit if you're uh, growing cereals on 25 centimeters, but you can consider if that's a possibility for you to consider. Um, then you could consider to have a 20% reduced seed rate and maybe also a 20% reduced in rate. That's our normal recommendation for grass production fields. I know there's a big difference between a few months of cover cropping and then two years of grass seed production, but it's all about not getting too big and too dense a uh, spring cereal because if it's too high, too dense, too much nitrogen, there's both risk from logging, but it's also too too dark in the bottom of the cereal. Um, of course, you need to be aware of slugs. Slugs are one of the major threats for spring uh, uh, for the undersown uh, cover crop. So be aware of slugs, monitor slugs and apply accordingly. And then uh, the last thing is around harvest. And what we normally see is that you can get a good spring crop growing. You can get a perfect under sown crop ready in the bottom of your uh, spring cereal, but it can all fall apart the last two weeks before harvest. And if we take pers uh, perspective on the spring barley, you know, it's always the last two weeks before we harvest the spring barley that there's a risk of the hits tipping over and uh, and makes lodging, and uh, you can always drop the heads on the uh, on the soil. And sometimes you'll need to have a because of that you will have a very um, a short cutting distance with the combine header. So it's it's really the last two weeks. There's a big risk that you will lose your undersown crop. So what we normally recommend is that you try to harvest your your spring cereal crop with the undersown cover crop as early as possible. So if you can. It's the first priority to harvest, so you get it 
off early as possible because it's better to harvest it early with a few percentage more moisture you can dry out than it is that it will in the last two weeks kill your undersown crop. You could also consider if if it if it would be a possibility for you to um I'm not is it's called wind rowing and swathing in uh, in English. So you will with a with a swather you would put it into uh, a, a swath so it can dry off for a week if it's good weather and then you have already for most of the field you have made light available for your undersown uh, cover crop. And then depending on your ambitions and what your farming system is, it's also a major benefit to bale the straw after the combine to let even more light into the, the soil. And then ideally you should get the straw back afterwards if you have local dairy farmers and stuff like that. But it's also depending on what cover crop species you grow, a possibility to bale the straw. Um, don't worry, there's more, there's pictures coming up, but I just have all these basics to uh, to say first. So in regards to um, how to seed small seeds, which we have already talked about, just to cover it up, uh, even, uh, even small seeds need to be covered by soil. So try to put it into a little bit of soil. Most grass and clovers like eight degrees soil temperature. That's why a second pass seeding uh, when the cereal has one to three leaves will provide a warmer, hence a faster germination of your grasses and clovers. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to wait seeding your grasses and clovers. On my own farm, we have seeded spring barley two weeks ago, and the spring barley is currently at one leaf stage, but we will probably end of next week, go out and drill a second time uh, the field with our uh, grass seed, which we will need to under sow. Uh, because then the soil is a little bit dry and a little bit uh, warmer, and that will be faster germination for grass seed. Um, then uh, topsoil moisture is very important to manage accordingly, so do not over-till your soil. It, uh, you have a big risk that you will excessively, uh, um, by excessive tillage, you will um, dry out your topsoil, and depending on how the weather will go after seeding, you will you will have this risk of having five to ten centimeters really dry powdery soil where you are waiting for the rain and that's not good to put in your small seeds so if you are aiming at doing this second pass drilling or getting your small cover crops uh, seeded try to do as little uh, tillage as possible in the topsoil so you are still saving some water for your small seeds to germinate um, seeding depth, uh, as I already mentioned, two centimeters, two centimeters will rule of thumb work for most grasses and clovers. Ideally, white clover is a really small seed and needs closer to one centimeter as possible. But again, it's better to have a little bit of soil coverage than no soil cover. Um, so that's the, my main advice to you. Then from a seed size, uh, both grass and clover seeds are really small and make sure uh, before you are too busy that your seeding equipment is able to handle the seeds, both because grass seeds are really light, so air drills will sometimes struggle to uh, meter the grass seeds correctly because of the different flow dynamics of pressurized air in your air drill. And likewise, uh, normal uh, non-air seed drills can have risk of being able to go slowly enough and stuff like that. An old trick in Denmark, depending on your seed drill, is that you can mix in uh, rolled oats with your small seeds in order to make your drill better handle low seeding rates. This is uh, from my own farm a few years back with spring barley under sown with uh, a grass seed called Coxfoot. I have no idea what the Finnish name would be for that. Koiran heinä. Okay, yeah, koiran heinä. So um, what you see here is that we have seeded uh, the barley, and when the barley had between one and three leaves, we did a second pass drilling with our no-till drill and put in the, the coxfoot. And the most important here is that before the barley will do um, canopy closure, 
that your grasses has emerged and have a few leaves, so they are ready to to stand the chance of being in the dark for between six and eight weeks. So as long as you seed the the cover crop and it germinates and get a few leaves before canopy closure, then your undersown crop will be fine for the next six to eight weeks before it's you know your your crop is um, heading and flowering. Uh, yes, and it looks like this at harvest. I'm not sure how good the picture is, but here I've just uh, harvested in, chopped the straw, and you can see the, the green in between the mature barley rows. And a closer picture is here how it looks when you are outside of the chopped straw. So this grass is really ready to capture some sunlight. We are in the first early days of August in high climate. And this grass is really ready to grow. And a few days later, it looked like this is really exploding growth uh, if it's not too dry because the, it's, it's already ready to grow away. Um, I did not have a picture of the swathing of cereals. So this is uh, in a grassy crop where we have swathed, but it's been swathed and had been laying there for 12 days. And in those 12 days where we have waited for the crop to mature and get ready to harvest. In between the swaths, the grass has really grown quite a lot. And you can get the same effect if you have a reasonable weather forecast with not too much rain, then you can swath your spring uh, cereal to get light and growth into your undersown crop one, two weeks earlier than you would have been able to if you're waiting for normal harvest. Okay. Big question, what species to undersow? And I'm sure that you have a, a lot of knowledge about that in your finished conditions. I just wanted to put in uh, my perspectives on this. And in general, I believe that forest type grassland species would be really uh, ideal. Um, my example with coxwood uh, as a grass is that coxwood is a re reasonably cheap, but also fast growing. Uh, grass when it's cold and it's the good thing with coxfoot is that it's not too difficult to spray out with most uh, grass weed herbicides and it competes really well with weed so if you are prepared to add a grass in your cover crop mixture i believe that coxfoot could actually be really interesting for you to look into then of course uh, red and white clover are really interesting uh, candidates uh, select large leaf forest types and then if you need a good non-grass nitrogen catch species, then uh, chicory is in our Danish trials normally really good to do deep rooting and catch a lot of nitrogen. The important thing with all of these species is that they are, they really need to be under sown, established in the spring together with your spring barley and oats in order to really deliver in the autumn. And I believe that a mixture suggestion could be somewhere around eight kilos of red clover and four kilos of a large, uh, large leafed white clover, and then two kilos of chicory. That would be a really a power mixture to uh, both do nitrogen fixing, but also catch some nitrogen. It can be very expensive in seed rates, but if you can afford it, high seed rates are one of the main drivers for large cover crop biomass production. Yes. And they do it quite a lot in the organic uh, production in Denmark. And this is a red clover under sown in a, I think it's spring uh, under seeded into a winter wheat actually in this this case, but it's it's how it can look after harvest. And for most of the trials we've done in Denmark, red clover really works reliably. So if you get the seeding technique right, red clover is a really productive uh, species for making large biomass and nitrogen fixing doing the autumn. And then just a quick note on some of the alternatives to um, to spring under sowing, uh, which we can do here. I think it might be applicable for the areas where you grow winter wheat in in Finland also. But if uh, I'm not, um, I think Thomas mentioned to me earlier that it's well, it's only in the southern part and the warmest part of Finland that you're real reliably growing winter wheat maybe, but uh, you have different possibilities. And if you're growing winter crops, you can spread your cover crops at this kind of maturing stage in your wheat when it goes from being green to being yellow. 
then there's still moisture in the bottom of the crop and then you can spread the seeds on top. This is from my own farm where we sometimes do like this, uh, spreading the seeds before harvest. Another perspective is to have uh, spreading equipment mounted on your combine harvester in the back. So you will get the seeds spread onto the um, bare soil and then you will cover it by chopped straw afterwards and get better germination. Normally I uh, encourage my farmers not to invest in this sort of expensive equipment on the combines because if they have a cheap approach like the picture here, you can just do that in the morning before you go to the field in midday with the combine. So you have more flexible approach by doing doing it boom mounted instead of doing header mounted. And if the weather plays nice and there's a little bit of moisture, then your cover crop will look like this at the day of harvest. So it's the same. This is the same area as this picture, just right after the combine. And you can see the clovers and the veg has already started uh, growing those few weeks prior to harvest. And this was actually a really good cover crop year. So this is in the same headland as you saw the tractor earlier in, in October 2017, which was, was a really warm autumn. And we did a huge, I'm not sure we had such a good cover crop ever since actually. It was a really good year for cover cropping. And this was even also where we had extra high seed rates. We, we played around a little bit with the seed rates. So warm autumn and high seed rates are very important for getting such a big cover crop. And then finally, um, I have been inspired. Or I have um, read a little bit about how they do it in more cold climates, and I might um, try and convince some of my Baltic farmers to uh, to try this also. Because if you have, a, we we don't get a sufficient enough winter in Denmark to do it, I believe. But if you have a good uh, winter freeze in your topsoil during the winter in your winter cereals, then the Americans call it frost seeding. So you uh, play around what is normally we don't like this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the right term, but the loosely translated from Danish would be up freezing. So the soil gets fluffy and up freeze uh, during uh, the winter. And that's normally not necessarily ideal for our winter cereals. But if you use this one centimeter of unfrozen topsoil during the day, if you spread your red clovers on top of that in the late winter, early spring, then this continuous freezing in the night, uh, thawing in the day with the top centimeter will actually move the seeds into the soil. And then when the soil really warms after winter, your red clovers will germinate and grow in the bottom of your crop. So. I think if you get the techniques done right, it can be a um, quite effective way to establish um, cover crops in the bottom of your winter cereals or winter oilseed rape if you are able to grow uh, such crops in your rotation. Um, but I believe um, like uh, with the spreading before harvest that there's a big potential if the weather is right and if the season is right, but it's also more uh, risky and there's probably a larger risk of more variable results. Whereas playing the safe card would be as we've discussed with the um, underseeding together with under sowing together with your spring crops. And again, clover uh, seems to work fine in this. That was what I had prepared for you, and I'm looking forward for questions and discussion. <laughs>